and I am now joined by Todd Pierce, who is a retired U.S. Army major and Guantanamo JAG attorney, um, and he ha is going to speak to us on a number of different topics that are unique, uh, you know, as opposed to the the other discussions that we might have uh, for the rest of this vigil. So, Todd, can you explain to us uh, what you were just telling me off air about? Uh, you know, the significance of yesterday's date and some of the issues that you've been talking about um, before the latest news about Julian Assange broke. So yesterday, May, April 4th, was the 51st anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination in Memphis, Tennessee, which actually about a year and a half ago or so when I was passing through Memphis, I drove through there just to see the assassination site and to have a better picture of what might have happened. Uh, but 52 years ago, Martin Luther King spoke at the Riverside Church in New York City, and he gave a speech that uh, a friend of mine, Cora Weiss, has said what she was told by Andrew Young was the most important speech other than the I Have a Dream speech that Martin Luther King had given. And I encourage people to go and look up the April 4th, 1967 Riverside Church speech by Martin Luther King, in which he, go, he speaks against U.S. militarism, He's speaking against the U.S.-Vietnamese war. Uh, he got criticized for doing so because a lot of people said, people like LBJ said, no, keep your, keep your mind on civil rights and don't pay attention to what else we're doing here. And uh, Martin Luther King, though, had the courage to put the, uh, you know, import, saw the emphasis of opposing the Vietnamese war. And so he spoke against U.S. militarism, uh, what the U.S. was doing in the world, not just in Vietnam, and what it was doing to itself and the people that it was killing of its own citizens and, and taking money, you know, resources away from people that needed it in the United States and giving it into this military engine in Vietnam that was just throwing billions and billions of dollars away, wasting it uh, with no human benefit to it except killing people uh, by the U.S. And so he's very critical of it. And, and as I said in a talk I gave yesterday, he showed a student you know, a perception of what was going on by the U.S. Uh, and actually, if you go and look, and I gave a little more of a talk of how uh, the Cold War, you know, when, when it began coming out of World War II, uh, putting aside World War II and the merits of that, but coming out of it, a mindset had been developed by a lot of military generals and other people. And out of it came the military industrial complex. Out of the Manhattan Project uh, came the idea that we have to have this ultra secrecy we must keep all these secrets from the American people because we must concentrate decision making in a small group of people. We criticize that when the Soviet Union exercised that kind of control, but we were, as the United States was doing it from the end of World War II right down to today. Uh, and so there's no democratic decision making anymore. The national security state apparatus, and this has been written about by people like Michael Glennon, talking about double government and national security in a book called that. Uh, and, and elsewhere, <clears throat> Michael Glennon was actually on the National Security Council. And, um, and there's, there's information out there if we go and look for it. But coming out of Vietnam, the generals blamed, just like Ludendorff did in Germany after World War I, blamed the civilians for losing the war. So Ludendorff said, he's the one who started this idea that uh, the Germans were stabbed in the back. And they put the blame on the Jews, but also on the Social Democrats you know, who, who had then come into government at the very tail end in order to make the surrender. And so Ludendorff blamed them, stabbed in the back, and that helped lead to the rise of Adolf Hitler. At the end of Vietnam, or even before the end, our American generals are saying we were stabbed in the back. Uh, there's a famous, actually a famous book within the military called uh, On Strategy by this colonel, and uh, he makes that argument. And the point is, that by diminishing our will by the anti-war movement, you know, and the will is a key, key thing in, in war making. It's always, you know, we have to make the enemy submit to our will, uh, otherwise they'll make us submit to their will. But the argument was that uh, the anti-war movement and the journalists who were reporting on the war had caused the American people to lose their will to win the war, and therefore we lost. So they shifted all the blame onto the civilians. And out of it, though, came this very sophisticated perception management that the U.S. military has been exercising ever since in a variety of ways. And what WikiLeaks did and Julian Assange did was they pierced that veil and let us see what the military is really doing in places like Iraq. And, and seeing how the military was once again, just like they had in Vietnam, uh, were losing a war and causing a tremendous catastrophe. And they gave us, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange gave us the opportunity to see what exactly we were really doing. You know, the idea that 
you know, the military has, you kill, you kill 10 people and you've got 10 less enemies. And they're too stupid to realize you kill 10 people, civilians and families and others, and it's natural, innate human, humanity, to have anger about that. This is, this, and this too is part of traditional understanding of war. People actually read it and understand it. Auschwitz understood it. War creates enemies. And so you have to find a way to get out of it. You can't do it perpetually like the US military says we're doing. But again, Assange and WikiLeaks open that window for us to see what's really going on. And that's why the US military, the CIA, the US government wants to arrest him and do put him, neutralize him totally, meaning take him out of sight. Absolutely. Does make- Sorry? Does that make sense to you? Absolutely makes sense. And I think it's a really great perspective to bring to the, to these latest events because I think we can talk about them to a, to a blue in the face. But, you know, obviously the Iraq and Afghan wars in, in the early 2000s were not the first time that war crimes have been committed. But, I mean, can you speak a little bit about the difference that it would have made in those previous wars if we had had an organization like WikiLeaks at the time, given the fact that obviously that we didn't have the internet and that it's a different situation in that sense. But if we had had a journalistic organization with the effectiveness and the integrity of WikiLeaks at that time, what difference do you think that could have made? Well, it would have accelerated the American people being aware of what's really being, what's really being done in their name. The war crimes taking place, and I've interviewed uh, as an oral history project a couple of retired generals, uh, one of whom uh, who was tasked toward the end of Vietnam to investigate all the allegations of war crimes that had taken place, and he validated that they had all occurred in, I think, every instance. And he made the point that, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't defending it, but he's pointing out that this is what the nature of war is. Uh, people do, you know, they see their buddies killed. Uh, and they go out and they react. It's human, you know. It's not. It's and that's not defending it. It's to argue that no, we should not be in these types of wars. We should only be in a war when it's absolutely necessary. And we have not seen anything like that since World War II. Uh, so, uh, but the point being is, we 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 have these soldiers, Marines all over the world engaging in you know these these various wars that we call perpetual war, and and it happens. It happens because it because they take casualties and then they go and retaliate against the local people in too many cases. I'm not saying it happens all the time and nor was this general saying it happens all the time, but it happens frequently, so frequently that we see the effect that we are today. I mean, look, 9-11, we had a small group of people who had their grievances too because they had been being attacked already by the United States in the Mideast for well over two decades. Uh, And so they retaliated with what happened on 9-11. Uh, with what we've done since, going into all these other countries and attacking and killing civilians with drones, we've, we've magnified that beyond belief to where now we're spending this next year $750 billion, you know, on, on the military alone, not counting all the CIA. So going back to your question about what would have happened in Vietnam, Vietnam started in, 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 in really got going in 1964, but had there been a WikiLeaks even before revealing what the United States was already doing in Vietnam, the re- the, the United States was not innocent in this. We were launching uh, subversion attacks into North Vietnam long before the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident. It was called Op Plan 34A, the idea of sending in saboteurs to destroy things in North Vietnam. So we were waging war against North Vietnam before the Gulf of Tonkin. And that might have actually been an accent from what I've read that uh, they thought they were the North Vietnamese Navy who did fire one torpedo at least, thought they were intercepting a ship bringing the Op Plan 34A saboteurs in, and, and, but it was a re, you know, regular Navy ship who fired back. And then that got magnified into the pretext for the war. But had we been aware of what we were doing there before, and I'm, I'm gonna make a wild guess that we're probably doing something similar in Venezuela right now. Uh, just a wild guess, speculation. But if you go back to all of our wars, that's the American way of war. First we send in saboteurs, do all these different things, uh, attacking them at a lower intensity conflict level, so to speak. And, and then finally, we create a pretext for us to go in for a full scale attack. And that's what we did with Vietnam. So if there had been a WikiLeaks then, uh, you know, maybe we could have caught that. I've been reading William Fulbright, Senator William Fulbright, who became a war opponent, but even he wasn't at the beginning is my recollection. But he too recognized how we were becoming this militaristic state. 
and we had to stop that. And um, again, if WikiLeaks had been there, maybe we wouldn't wouldn't have 50,000 names on a Vietnam wall today in DC, nor would there have been a million plus Vietnamese uh, who were killed by the United States, which is a human tragedy in itself that we have killed so many people since the end of World War II. Absolutely, no question. I think another another aspect of this whole issue that that your experience can shed light on, um, you know, as far as your experience um, as an attorney re relating to um, Guantanamo Bay, um, can you? Um, I, I know I'm asking you to speculate, but can you discuss for our read our audience uh, what what type of treatment Assange might expect if he is arrested by the UK and then extradited to the US? Uh it, it will depend. Here, here's a frightening thing is, uh, so I, I'm on the case of uh, Al Balul. Uh, I'm still on it actually, because it, uh, it's an appellate case and uh, it, we're still in a stage, uh, we lost the appeal, but now we have to go back for resentencing, hopefully. Uh, not that it will help him, I'm sure, but uh, he was a journalist. He, he, he made a documentary, that was his offense. I mean, you know, uh, saying, here's why we fight. You know, uh, who was it in, in the 1940s? Uh, the, the Hollywood uh, producer who made a video too on why we fight the United States. Well, Balul did the same thing, listing the grievances that people of the UMA, the Arab people, felt that they had as a grievance against the United States. And just to tell anybody who doesn't know, it was three things. It was the uh, United States killing 500,000 Iraqi children by the sanctions that nobody disputes. And again, what, how would we feel if uh, 500,000 children were killed in say New York state by a foreign power? Uh, Absolutely, that one, yeah. Grievance. The other one was the uh, propping up or the supporting of the Saudi regime, which uh, you know, not getting into the, the disagreements between people in uh, you know, groups of resistance against the Saudi regime, but uh, obviously it's a, it's a despotic regime, always has been or has, always has been. And so that was a second grievance. And I was there, I was in the first Iraq war and I saw the massive transfer of what we were leaving behind to the Saudis, military equipment. So we, we are definitely propping them up. And then the third one uh, was the uh, perpetual Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories and the harsh treatment given the Palestinians. That was in 1999. Those are the three reasons why they justified their attacks on the United States. Now they have so many more. I mean, people, whether ISIS or, or Al Qaeda, and I'm not justifying any of that, but I'm just explaining that this is what how they see things. And I'm, I'm a, uh, I, I studied uh, Hannah Arendt quite a bit and, and Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King, both of them talk of how we have to see things through other people's eyes. We can't kill 500,000 Iraqi children and think that people who have sympathy with those children aren't going to feel anger over it, with a couple perhaps turning to violence. Uh, we turned to violence after Pearl Harbor. We turned to violence after 9-11. It's the same human condition, this uh, demand for retaliation or revenge. Uh, so, so that's what, uh, you know, a WikiLeaks during the Vietnam year, years could have told us more of. Uh, is, is how the Vietnamese were seeing things. Now we, were, we justified as we were fighting communism. Uh, and, and I'm not a defender of the, the you know, regimes that exercise quite a bit of despotic control back in, during the Cold War. But the other hand, you know, not to justify it, but they were under attack. And so when you're under attack, you, 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 yep, you turn to more despotic control. And that's what South Vietnam did as well under our direction. Uh, South Vietnam, and I've talked to people who were there and were at a higher level, and we had put in place in South Vietnam a very despotic regime. One person who uh, I spoke to in Dan Ellsberg knows told me that, you know, it, it made, you know, it made it inevitable that the South Vietnamese regime would not be able to survive because it had created so much anger amongst its own people. And that gets into, you know, well, if we'd have known more of that. And, and if uh, there's some way of broadcasting that more than just a few reporters on the ground who once in a while could get an article in to a major newspaper, which was their only source of news at that time.
Absolutely. And I think that 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 really does bring up the fact that, uh, you know, the way that Americans view themselves and their military conduct overseas so often is the assumption that America are the good, that they are the good guys, that they're the world police, and that's morally acceptable. And I think that what WikiLeaks has done is really, um, you know, revealed that attitude um, for what it really is and the type of war crimes that it kind of allows to go under the radar. And I, I really do think that that's one of the biggest impacts that they've had. Uh, do you uh, do you have any response? And I asked this of Ray McGovern earlier, but do you have any response to the Trump supporters who say that they support WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, but who respond to the recent, you know, re revelation by WikiLeaks that Ecuador may expel Julian Assange, quote, imminently, um, you know, within hours or days? That those Trump uh, Trump supporters often respond with, "Well, Trump's going to save Julian. He's going to bring him to the U.S. to save him." Can you respond to that so that they, are, so those viewers might understand what what Assange really would be facing? Trump, Trump has so distorted people's American people's minds. Uh, I, I, I argued to a number of people, including people like Ray, who, who didn't argue back or d disagree from the very beginning that Trump was not a tonic to the neoconservatives. You could see that by his very close connections to Benjamin Netanyahu, which if you read Haaretz you know, newspaper, the Israeli newspaper, uh, there you, you virtually daily, they have articles showing that close connection between Trump and, and uh, and, and Netanyahu and the Israeli radical right. Uh, William Crystal, you know, the neoconservative, uh, was so, is so enamored with Netanyahu that he said just a couple years ago, gee, I wish we could have him as president. So we can't take Israel out of the picture. And, and so these people who, these, these Trump supporters who, some of whom were well-intentioned, but they, they believed him. They believed Trump when he would throw out every once in a while that, well, I'm, I was against the Iraq war or it's a dumb war. And they, so they have grabbed onto that as if it was just a little reed to save their lives and, and project onto him as being somebody as a non-interventionist. And, and when he's, you know, he, I mean, he's all over the place, as you know. So when he said something about uh, whatever, something, you know, WikiLeaks let us know about this, I forget this particular so comment. He said, I love WikiLeaks a number of times yeah. on the campaign trail. But people believe him. You know, I mean, people are gullible enough to believe him that, okay, here, here's a guy He's an anti-war guy. He's supportive of WikiLeaks. And you'll know, remember Hillary Clinton was saying uh, she wanted to capture, capture Assange and you know, do whatever. Uh, so so these, there's a few anti-war people who sort of thought, well, OK, Trump, all of his faults, but yeah, he'll stop the war. So very gullible, wrong. Uh, you, as you can see and with, with Venezuela, you can see with a massive military buildup going, taking place in the United States. And let me add though, that here's the other side of things. Uh, John McCain, who's always held up as a hero to Americans, great American, you know, Mc, uh, Trump came in to office, said we have to raise the military budget and offered, you know, 63 billion, I think was the number. John McCain come along and said, oh no, no, that's not nearly enough. We need a hundred billion dollars. So they ended up giving it the John McCain National Security National Fund, you know, Funding Act, whatever, and boosted military spending a hundred billion dollars up to seven hundred billion from its six hundred billion. Bear in mind, Russia spends seventy billion about. And I should add that yeah. that's per year. That's not you know that's, total. That's per, that's year. per year, yeah. yeah. Just so so, so we we we've inflated Russia into this great enemy. And we tried to attach Assange to Putin, you know, as you know, I had a progressive friend, I say had, because I don't know if he is anymore, but he was particularly rabid, I mean, against Putin, Trump, but also Assange. He, he took, he accepted the propaganda that, but for Assange and WikiLeaks and, and Putin, Trump would not have won the election. Well, I won't go into the other issue of who really gave him the support. You can read it on Harvard's, but, uh, uh, but that was, you know, so many people believe that. And, uh, and so it, you know, it, it turns some people, so you, so you have two, you, so you ended up with a perverse situation where some Trump people supported Assange, had this misguided faith that Trump would save them, uh, like you, you just mentioned, wow. and failing to see that, no, Trump, Trump's a liar. You have to look at everything he's saying as a lie, and you have to pierce through what his lies to see what he's really intending, and that's plain as day. He, he's fully on board with the wars, uh, you know, Iran, uh, China, uh, 
Venezuela and how, what priority they'll be. I mean, obviously Venezuela is at the top of the heap now, uh, but this idea that he uh, is not, uh, uh, that he's a friend of Russia, that's a, that's a falsehood too. Uh, in a whole lot of ways, you can see the nuclear buildup taking place that it was accelerated under Obama uh, and, and it was under the Bush administration where they first pulled out of the ABM treaty, but it was under Trump where we were doing a whole lot more against Russia. So, so again, we, we have our think tanks, which are really propaganda centers, creating these false stories and, and they have been since World War II. It goes back to the Rand Corporation and working on behalf of the military industrial complex, uh, which you know Eisenhower first warned us about, uh, C. Wright Mills wrote about in The Power Elite. People need to go back and read some of the stuff from the 50s and 60s to really see what we're doing today because it's a can, uh, can, you know, daisy chain straight down to today what's happening. So Absolutely. we have all these think tanks producing propaganda, pro-war propaganda. And, and when one just diverges slightly, you know, I'd rather, you know, like in, Trump, in Trump's case, uh, he's made clear, he sees China and Steve Bannon, they see China as a main enemy at the moment of highest priority. And then you have the neoconservatives, uh, people like Crystal and, and uh, Elliot Cohen and others who've always said, and the Kagans who've never seen a war they didn't want, uh, always you know, pushing it on to Russia. Uh, and Bolton, Bolton, he's happy with war everywhere. You know, no, no need to prioritize. Not to mention so Elliot it, Abrams recently, you know, the, the, the whole issue with that. Um, can I ask you uh, if, if you're using a laptop, if you could just uh, tilt your screen slightly downward because we have a banner that's cutting off your chin a little bit. Thank you, perfect, that's great. But yeah, no, I think that that's incredibly important. And I think you're totally right when you tell people to go back to the history of the 50s and 60s and even through the 70s and 80s with Iran-Contra and some of the, that wrongdoing. I mean, it's that history really does inform the present. But. And that's what WikiLeaks was doing and Julian Assange were doing. They were exposing these things that we need to know as a democracy. Right. They were not changing our national security. They were enhancing it because democratic participation is a better way of decision-making, particularly in war and, and, and uh, national security. Uh, let me just add one more thing. I, hate, I hope I'm not please talking do. too much. But no, General do. Westmoreland, who headed the Vietnam War effort, uh, he, he, was, he spent the four years previous to going to Vietnam as the superintendent of West Point. His biggest accomplishment that he boasted of was uh, two things. One was uh, expanding the West Point student body number and the other was getting a football, new football stadium built. He wanted to expand the student body because he wanted a bigger selection of football people to choose from for football players. He's, he's obsessed with football. Uh, that's what he spent his four years previous on. He had nothing ever to do, anything ever to do with Asia before. You know, he made it, his, as an army officer, he had spent his time in World War II and then was an administrator the rest of his time. But yet on the way to Vietnam, according to a book about it, uh, I, a legitimate, I mean, a uh, credible book by a former army officer, Louis Sorley. Uh, he, Westmoreland wrote to his father that, well, I'm going to Vietnam, it's a mess, uh, but the problem, biggest problem is going to be the, the journalists there. We're going to be butting in and, and this and that. And criticizing the journalists before he had even landed in Vietnam, before he'd even met a Vietnamese probably. And, and then the, uh, uh, journalists that were there, some of them who had been there 10 years, some were married to Vietnamese women. They responded, would later respond that, you know, what is he saying? He's coming here, he, is, he knows nothing, but yet he's the immediate expert and we don't know anything as journalists, even though we spent 10 years here. I mean, it's madness, but it's typical of how the military works. In the military, when you're assigned to a position, you're virtually almost immediately considered the expert in that position. I mean, it's ludicrous, but it's how, you know, how the military works. Uh, and so therefore, Westmoreland, with all of his ignorance bring, that he's bringing along and probably dreams of his football stadium yet, uh, going to Vietnam to be the commander in chief of uh, all US forces and Vietnamese forces in Vietnam. And he made a complete cache of things, even more than it would have been otherwise. Uh, uh, anyway. But that's why we need to know. That's why we need, I mean, that's, that's why we, need, we had initially the right to know. James Madison made a point uh, in, in when they're getting the Bill of Rights passed and particularly the First Amendment, that the whole basis of democracy is the right to know. If you don't have an informed citizenry, you don't have a democracy. 
<coughs> Absolutely. No, that's a massively important point. If we lose the free press, which I think if Assange is, is prosecuted for what he's done, which is exceptional journalism, then we no longer have a free press. And in my opinion, we're no longer a free people at that point. And well, and, and we're probably not already in a way. Sheldon Wolin, who's a who was a Princeton uh, University uh, political theorist, Chris Hedges has written about him extensively. Uh, he wrote way back in 1990, I'm sorry, 2003, that we are already an inverted totalitarian, totalitarianism in that we still had elections, but they weren't really free because they were so well bought. And we ended up, you know, we really didn't have a choice in who our candidates would be. They were basically made by others. And we saw that perfectly with the uh, Hillary Clinton uh, information we got of how her and, and uh, Wasserman Schultz were colluding uh, to keep Bernie Sanders from fully participating in the primaries or, or hindering his uh, progress. So again, that came from WikiLeaks, if I'm correct. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, and, a, lot of, a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters uh, believe that the election, the primary election in 2016 in the Democratic primary system was rigged against Sanders. And we all, myself included, being a, a former Sanders supporter, um, you know, we really at a gut visceral level felt that. But when WikiLeaks published the DNC emails and later the Podesta emails, that's when we really had evidence to point to that that was the case. So, And, and I still believe, I, I honestly believe that I think Sanders would have had a better chance of defeating Trump than Hillary Clinton. I mean, we, we meaning people like down in the low levels here, so to speak, uh, I'm in Minnesota and we get our news, most people, you know, from the TV and whatnot. And, uh, but we're not really paying that much attention to most things. So we don't have it, you know, through mainstream media, we don't have access to it. But, uh, but what people knew, I mean, Hillary Clinton was probably the best known politician that we've ever had stand for president. We've known her for thir almost 30 years. And, uh, and they knew of the, I mean, people that ordinarily aren't paying a whole lot of attention to politics. They knew of the Wall Street payments to her for million dollars for a short speech or whatever, et cetera. You know, becoming multimillionaires or billionaires, you know, just a few short years after leaving office. That was reported in the New York Times just a couple of days before the election. Uh, so the idea that WikiLeaks spoiled her chances for winning is, is ludicrous. People knew Hillary Clinton. They knew how she was cashing in on her political and her husband's political career. Uh, and as reported to them once in a while, not very often, but by New York Times, for example, just a couple of days before where they did an article on basically who picks up the money for the Clinton Foundation. Uh, but again, WikiLeaks is the ones who revealed so much of that to begin with. And, and now they're demonized for being accused of get, getting Trump elected, which again, like I said, is ludicrous. People were not gonna vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, yeah, okay, she won the popular vote, but I mean, in the electoral vote system on these small states, Minnesota, all these Midwestern states, we were deep, you know, horribly, uh, you know, catastrophically uh, harmed with the 2008 meltdown by Wall Street. You know, people don't have a favorable impression of Wall Street or the people that they pay millions of dollars to, to enrich. So. So in those states that were particularly harmed by the 2008 meltdown, that would include Wisconsin, Michigan, which Hillary Clinton lost both of, uh, had nothing to do with uh, Russian bots or any of that other stuff. It was because it had been harmed so harshly, so severely in the 2008 meltdown, which was attributed and, and obviously with good reason to Wall Street. Or, of course, you know, and, and not only not only uh, what did uh, the Clinton campaign, the DNC, suggest that Donald Trump should be elevated in the press as a Pied Piper candidate because they felt he would be the easiest Republican or GOP nominee right. to beat, but we also saw that you know the the, the loss was uh, blamed in part on Russian troll farms and social media uh, uh, input. But there were only forty four thousand dollars approximately spent on those Russian ads before right. the election happened. And countering that, you had David Brock's uh, cor uh, correct the record, spending millions of dollars to have a, have a, a, to pay actual trolls on social media to basically propagandize in favor of Hillary Clinton. So, I think that that the argument that Russia interfered um, it just is completely without basis, and it's really deflected from the conversation that you're talking about that we should have had, which is the failure of Hillary Clinton and the DNC to really stand as a good candidate for all of the reasons that you just alluded to and more. 
And I'm a regular reader, like I say, of Haaretz. And uh, right now, with the Netanyahu election going on, all those things are being done on behalf of the Likud party, the right extreme right wing party, and by you know Netanyahu supporters in Israel. It's like they, uh, and I'm not going to suggest that it was done any of these same bad actors, but if you draw the line from you know a uh, network you know diagram, uh, you can see that some of the connections go back. You know, I mean, the, the Trump administration did more for Israel, and he proved too that he's the best friend of Israel would ever have. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, Golan Heights lately, and and you can see even the family connection with Trump's son-in-law, close friends with Netanyahu. And but if we'd have said that there's been election interference by Israel's radical right wing or some of the private firms that Trump hires, you know, Israeli private intelligence firms like Psy Group, uh, who else is there? Uh, there's a number of them that have interfered in elections elsewhere, like in India. Well, then we wouldn't have had justification to boost the military budget up $100 billion. So there's no incentive for perhaps pointing the finger. Now, I, I have an extreme view of things. I, I think we in the United States and with a radical right ally, such as Netanyahu and his friends, Bolsonaro and Trump's friends, Bolsonaro, that there is a very, there is a extreme radical right wing coalition coming together or already together. Uh, and that's where we need to be looking more for what's going on versus Russia, which is this uh, neutered, so to speak, country ever since the end of the Cold War, but trying to build them up into the new enemy now to justify hundreds of billions of dollars of more military spending. And I think that's part of what's going on as well. You don't get military spending increases like $100 billion in one year by not having an enemy. And so we needed to boost Russia up as the enemy. But to sit there and say that it's because Trump and he and Putin are friends, that, that was ludicrous when you really do the research. And again, the research is being done. It's not impossible to do. It's being done in, in Israel by Haaretz, you know, and, and they're revealing what Netanyahu is doing. And, but I would add as well though, if we knew more of that, uh, we, we wouldn't be enabling neither the corruption uh, of ne uh, Netanyahu and, and Trump because we keep the lid on it and don't reveal it to people. So we, we've enabled Netanyahu who's got all of his own corruption problems in Israel, but we don't talk about it here in the United States when we should be. And, and that close connection, you know, and, and what's the parallels there. But anyway, I'm getting off subject. No, but I think it's really important because it, there are so many conversations like that, including that and in, in addition to it, that we haven't had. And it's really important to say that, that, you know, we can debunk Russiagate all day long, but it's still, it has still been effective as a narrative in right. having us talk about it rather than these other important issues. And I think sure. by getting the truth out, you provide a genuine counter narrative to this. And again, it goes to who benefits, you know, who's benefited by Trump's election. It hasn't been Russia, you know, they've got 100 billion more dollars on top of the 600 billion arrayed in buying weapons. I was just reading Defense News, which is published by both the Atlantic uh, Publishing Company or something. It, it's basically a mouthpiece for the military industrial complex. Talking about all the money we're putting into new weapons, you know, and celebrating it in, in anticipation of a war against Russia. It's madness. And that's what, that's what Martin Luther King said back in 1967, it's madness. And the madness hasn't ceased. Definitely not. In fact, it, it seems to have just gotten exponentially worse over the over the decades that followed his and, death. But. And the one thing that was one of the, the main thing that was working since 9-11 was WikiLeaks, getting that information out to us. Julian Assange, uh, you, know, call, you know, martyring himself, you could say, as we were seeing now. So there needs to be a worldwide demand. I mean, and here's what I tell him. I, I have a... British friend who, like I say, was particularly maddened by this news, you know, and ate up this anti-Trump, anti-Putin, anti-WikiLeaks propaganda. I said, you know, you're, you're crazy. The uh, United States has been taunting our, our NATO commanders, who are always U.S. military officers, the NATO is merely a, a subordinate, you know, command to the United States, uh, that uh, we, we've been taunting Russia in so many ways and expanding NATO, et cetera, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, these people, the 
who had been running the national security state all of a sudden became heroes. They were going to be the anti-Trump, the resistance. And that was madness. These are the same people who were torturing people that ended up in Guantanamo and the black sites, et cetera. These are the same people have been running these wars, killing people, drone attacks, et cetera. And all of a sudden we're going to elevate them, promote them into truth speakers. I mean, that was madness in itself. But I told my British friend, you know, you're also crazy if you think that the US military isn't willing to just incinerate a large portion of Europe uh, as collateral damage. Because if we did get into the war that they are so eager to, to uh, promote with Russia, because hostilities do lead to war, uh, if, it, it, if it did lead to a war by a border incident or something, you know, uh, and elevated quickly to exchange a battlefield nuclear weapons, uh, it's going to elevate very rapidly and it would be Europeans who would be being incinerated, not Japanese this time. And it is policy by the US, of the US to not uh, forego first strike nuclear weapons. And, and I think that was an open secret in the Iraq war that they were there and they were available to be used if necessary. And so Europeans, they would be the ones right in the middle. And uh, they, need to, they need to open their eyes and realize that uh, it doesn't need to be an intentional war. It could be an accidental war and all of a sudden millions and millions of Europeans would be dying. And that's a, something that's been written about by uh, Dan Ellsberg and uh, a friend of mine, William Polk, uh, both of whom have written on nuclear war back and, and the risks of it back in the 50s and 60s. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the US military was the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were pushing Kennedy. They wanted to go to war against Russia because they saw it as an opportunity. And they knew that there would be some retaliation back by the Russians, because of course, if you attack another country, uh, like when, when Germany attacked Russia, Russia defended itself and, and attacked back. Well, if we'd have attacked Russia, like generals, like General LeMay and others, there's a, like four generals, uh, or, uh, there, there were four, uh, what was it? Um, three to, I'm sorry, five to 10 generals are really pushing for war. Uh, according the preemptive to the strike too. I, I preemptive think that's strike. exactly yeah. knowing that there'd be a retaliatory strike and willing to accept. I don't know what was it five to ten million American casualties, which again, if they're willing to accept, we're willing to accept then and would now because the mindset hasn't changed. A uh, five to ten million American casualties. How willing would they be to accept fifty million European casualties? Uh, Europeans need to once again begin paying attention to. Uh, what's taking place and the, the heightening of military uh, of tensions, realizing that it can lead to war and they're caught in the middle of it. Yeah, and I think that one of the problems is that in the last few years, as this um, aggression towards Russia has increased in, in volume and in pitch, um, I don't think the public has really taken into account the real dangers of a, of a nuclear war. I, don't, I think that although there, it seems to look like a, a second Cold War, the fear uh, coinciding with the first Cold War doesn't seem to have followed through, and I'm not a fan of fear mongering or, or you know, asking people to be afraid. But I don't think that people are taking that threat serious and seriously enough, especially in the resistance and the people that are, you know, really like your friend have bought into the anti Russiagate kind of hysteria. And I hate to see those people called progressives because I can consider myself a progressive, and I, uh, you know, that just seems like Trump derangement syndrome to me. But you know, it's a shame. Yeah, the worst kind. And so Trump supporters have the Trump derangement syndrome, thinking he's actually a man of peace, you know, right. an anti intervention So that's one form of Trump, Trump derangement syndrome. And the other one is this idea that, well, we, you know, Trump is colluding with Russia against us. And so we need to spend more money in the military. It's, it's, it's madness. You know, you wonder both, what's happening. Both, both of those narratives, whether it's the Trump as, as a bringer of peace and drainer of, of swamps, or whether it's Trump as the collaborator with Putin, both of those narratives are, are just fairy tales that have no evidence to back them whatsoever. Yeah, so, yeah. well, they, have, they have evidence showing something opposite, you know, right. that, that's where the evidence lies. But, you know, it's an evidence pre-belief. And I think that's the problem. I think that the American public has been so propagandized um, through cable news and, and all of the other like uh, monopolized news networks that they really have lost touch with the need for evidence. Um, but bringing us back to the to the CIA to the military industrial complex, um, 
can you speak at all? Did you ever um, have any interaction with, or can you speak to uh, the the nature of somebody like, let's say, Gina Haspel, who's now director of the CIA? And and I asked that question because, again, I want I know that a number of you know lots of Trump supporters are probably watching this stream, and I want them to understand the repercussions of Trump's nomination of somebody like Gina Haspel to the position of CIA director and what that means and why that is evidence that he's not draining the swamp, so to speak. Well, as, as you know, and, and here's something, Trump was the most Islamophobic, which was tough to do, you know, with Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio of the Republicans. And, and a, a more implied Islamophobia comes from all sides. You know, we got to fight terrorism. Well, that underneath that really means we got to fight Arabs, you know, Muslims. Um, but Trump was the most outspoken Islamophobe, and he is also the one who uh, uh, supported torture. So right there should have told you everything you need to know about Trump, and that was said early in the campaign. Uh, you know, you don't support torture and then at the same time be an anti-interventionist. So, uh, so it was logical and predictable that he would choose somebody who was accused of, and I have no firsthand knowledge of Haspel, uh, but I think we've written, you know, people from VIPS, the veteran intelligence professional for sanity, have written some things about her. And, uh, and she didn't have a reputation, I'll say in the, in the CIA as a humanitarian. I mean, they, I think it's out there pretty well that she was known as bloody Gina Haspel. Uh, and, and that too, you know, I mean, we, we project on to people, you know, there are civil servants. I mean, she's not just a civil servant. She's a CIA officer. And, and by that, I don't mean that all CIA officers are bad, but uh, uh, the CIA was created to do a lot of dirty business, you know, coups, et cetera. And, uh, and in, the, in, the Viet, in Vietnam, they did a lot of dirty business running the uh, Phoenix program, for example, which included torture. So none of this is new. Uh, you know, the dirty wars in Latin America run by the CIA. So Gina Haspel comes out of that tradition, you can say. And, uh, and the fact that Trump would choose her as director tells you everything you need to know about Donald Trump. Uh, you don't choose someone like that as director of the CIA. Uh, you know, Chuck Carter, when he was trying to undo some of the harm that the CIA had done, uh, he turned to Stansfield Turner, as my recollection, who who made it publicly known that he was rejecting all that previous uh, dirty work, uh, Trump turns to the person who is most notorious for it. And so again, what more do you need to know about Trump? Uh, so, I, and I've had a couple arguments with Trump supporters who are, who are on the supposedly peace activists. And you, it was only with Venezuela, I think that a couple of them started having their eyes open a bit, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think- the, Go ahead. No, I don't think uh, enough, and uh, you know, I don't know if it's lasting. Right, and I think that the same, you know, we could have the, we we could have the same exact conversation um, about Elliot Abrams, about John Bolton, right. and a number of the other appointees that that Trump has has placed into positions of power that have horrendous histories, just like Gina Haspel. And I think that the fact that you see those types of appointee appointments um, goes to your point. It really does. Um, you know, it, it would disappoint any, um, you know, honest Trump supporter who really believes that he was uh, going to be anti-interventionist, as he said. So with all of that in mind, um, you know, we, we have about 10 minutes, eight minutes left in the segment. Are there, are there any uh, topics we haven't covered that you want to? And, you know, if, if not, um, what are your thoughts moving forward about how uh, viewers can support Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, no matter their uh, political affiliation? But just, just for one second, uh, Bolton, Elliot Abrams, they come from the deepest part of the swamp. So Absolutely. much for creating the swamp. And they, if you they, want to discuss that, I'm all ears. That would be a great topic yeah. if you would like to. Yeah. You know, so, and, and here, let me say, uh, so much of memories fades, you know, individually and collectively. And so there's little as no one re remains no one of the dirty wars in, in the 1980s. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, and it wasn't the same connotation at the time, but uh, neoconservative in the 1980s was uh, somebody socially liberal, but uh, recognized the needs of national security. And so for a while, I considered myself a neoconservative in the 1980s until the end of the Cold War. And then it 
they fully revealed themselves as really just war lovers. So, so I read a lot of, uh, and, and my introduction to it was really an Israeli Defense Force officer who was doing a teaching at the University of Minnesota in political science who had been introduced to, and uh, he introduced me to Commentary Magazine. So my, my background comes out of neoconservatism, you could say. Prior to that, I'd been a liberal and uh, supported Carter and whatnot, but um, uh, things are changing and it seemed like, no, well, maybe Carter's not. And, and there, there's so much propaganda coming out. So I, I was a victim. I can speak as a victim of propaganda as well. Uh, and, and because there's no, and this is an important point, nobody was telling any other information. We had what was known in the CIA then, formed by, uh, known as Team B in the CIA, formed by George W. Bush, to present a counter narrative to what the official CIA was saying about Russia. They were saying Russia's a paper tiger, they don't have much. And so they formed Team B, and I forget all the names, but included people like Richard Pearl, the notorious neoconservatives of the last 20 years, who came up with a report that no, 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 Russia is this huge you know, uh, empire, uh, military power, et cetera, and we need to spend more resources. And that's what we were hearing back then. Uh, and and you know, knowing no better, you know, you believe it, you know, you know, uh, so. Well, that's the power of the lack of insight and transparency exactly. that organizations- That's where we could have used WikiLeaks. Exactly. That's where we could have used WikiLeaks really revealing so much of what was really going on. And in Latin America, what our dirty wars, wars were doing, how we were, uh, so, so I got to know uh, some people who had been involved there and whatnot in various ways and, uh, uh, you know, came to know at the time, or didn't know at the time, and, and, you know, I knew Nicaraguans who had been Sandinistas and had left uh, for various reasons. So I wasn't a uh, Republican supporter, but um, was looking at, you know, hearing other sides, you know, uh, uh, like say from former Sandinistas, but anyway, not really being able to put things together because nobody was putting information out that we could have used to really figure things out. And then as we learned later on, so much more of the uh, death squads that were in, in uh, El Salvador, for example, uh, to know better that, okay, whatever is going on here, there's the, the worst thing here is El Salvador. They're the ones we're supporting, et cetera. So again, to have had WikiLeaks then and, and somebody like Julian Assange to step forward and reveal that information would have saved us from all the war crimes that we're responsible for in Latin America. So anyway, uh, uh, and the other thing, like I say, was Team B. So we, we've had this con constant government lying and lying coming out of the CIA, always promoting wars overseas uh, and things going on here as well. Uh, so that was a bit of a digression perhaps, but getting back to your other question, what can be done? Was that it? Yeah, no, Mike. My uh, my question was just I mean if there's any was it, if there are any other topics you'd like to discuss you know or what can uh, viewers and listeners do to help WikiLeaks in your mind uh, no matter what their political affiliation is or if you'd like to discuss uh, the the kind of histories of people like Elliot Abrams and John Bolton for those who maybe well, don't so know I guess that's, that that's where I was going yeah so Elliot yeah. Abrams John Bolton I, I forget what John John Bolton's role was then but Elliot Abrams was right in the middle of it. He was the worst of the worst in Donald Rumsfeld's words. And, uh, and here he is again under Trump. That tells you everything you need to know about Trump as well. Elliot Abram is an interventionist from beginning to end. That's his life. And, and, and I won't get into his political theory that motivates him, but uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna be writing about that a little bit, but I think it's maybe it's time to uh, you know get over the reluctance to call this very militaristic system we have, waging war constantly and becoming increasingly authoritarian at home. There's only one political term that has been used in history to describe that in full, and that's the term fascist. Uh, Shell and Wolin used inverted totalitarianism, but uh, uh, he also wrote on fascism and whatnot. And if you use Mussolini's definition, not the political scientists who always lard it up with things that will never be accomplished, but Mussolini's definition of fascism was very to the essence, and that was militaristic, uh, celebrating the martial values. See the football games we have every weekend in the fall where we have the flyover jets, et cetera. Um, authoritarianism at home, 
and uh, uh, militaristically ag aggressive and expansionist. But also the thing that they added to fascism was the uh, ability because of the changes and advances taking place in psychology at the time of perception management. And there's a book out by an Israeli, former Israeli Defense Force uh, spokesperson on hearts and minds, where he describes, he's describing it favorably, but uh, describing how the United States and Israel both use perception management and consciousness. Uh, uh, what is the term? Uh, there's a lawsuit going on in Israel right now about how their consciousness is being managed by the Israeli government, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. And this is what fascism added to what previously existed as mere despotism, because we've had despotism, obviously, with the monarchies and everything for centuries and centuries. Fascism only added to that this uh, element of how do, how do you manipulate people's perceptions and their consciousness? That became what fascism was, uh, how Mussolini did it, how uh, it was done in Germany. But now we've taken it to an, a level never imagined before, you know, with what we've developed on how, how to manipulate people. And so I think you can make an argument that in fact, there's nothing lacking in the definition of fascism that uh, would exclude us. Nothing in the definition that would exclude us anyway. But the Absolutely. point is, one final point, let me, so yeah. earlier you mentioned uh, how we have this favorable vision of ourselves and, uh, and WikiLeaks sort of caused us to question that. But that's the important thing is we have this favorable impression and it's based upon childhood myths that we right. are fed here in the United States, that we arrived here as a pilgrims, we had Thanksgiving dinner with the Indians, and, and then the story ends, and nobody goes into it anymore. Later we hear, you know, that if we hear of it anymore, we probably don't, but of the you know Indian Wars of the 1800s. But in fact, and I and I was curious, I just went back and found some Mayflower documents or papers. And um, and sh sure enough, of course we I mean, when we arrived on these shores, we arrived here as as uh, conquerors, you know, or not, we didn't have to conquer to get in here, but we arrived here with the intent of colonizing the place and taking the land, you know, by any means necessary from the indigenous people, which we did. And of course that produced war almost immediately. And so it wasn't this clean history of landing here and maybe slightly moving out with settlements, but rather we landed here and almost immediately wars broke out because the Native Americans recognized what we were doing. We were taking their land, we were stealing it. And, and the pilgrims weren't uh, these pacifist Christians. They were a very militaristic Christian sect, the, the Puritans, who some of them went back and fought with Cromwell in some of the worst wars of English history. So again, we, we didn't begin this country as pacifists, you know, Christian pacifists. We began it as a very, very militaristic uh, and warrior type Christian sect cult, if you will. Uh, and we've been that way ever since. And, and if you look and if you could put it in some sort of a form of, on a computer, you could show how it's all expanded out like some kind of cancer. And that's what's going on today. And I don't know what better way to describe it than a kind of cancer. I can't undo it, but what changed at the end of World War II was we also had the, brought the UN into existence and we began creating international law against wars of aggression. And, and that's the change. We, we, maybe we can't undo the history before, but we can say, okay, if we're gonna be a rules-based society in, in international order, uh, we have to start obeying the rules. And that begins at the top, not at the bottom. And so that's the answer to me is whatever our sins before, we've got to stop sinning now uh, by you know, being by, violating international law. And we're not, we're, we're bringing it forward. Even when uh, we deny a visa to the ICC prosecutors, for example, just recently. So there's a whole lot of uh, need for WikiLeaks because we're not getting the information from mainline journalism. Definitely. And, and for and that, the American that is... people in the world needs to be grateful to Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for revealing what they have so far. And uh, hopefully you can keep revealing more and more.